Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, uh, I'm going to be your professor uh, for the second lecture in the series Education uh, 101. My name is Ian Phillips. Uh, this is Intro to Education, Intro to Teaching, uh, however you really want to call it. Um, but again, the course is really just designed for um, you know undergraduates uh, at the uh, you know obviously college level undergraduate level course um, where you have uh, student teachers looking to get into the field right so you're a student teacher you want to best your chances uh, for getting a job and um, also for people who are student observers right people just getting acquainted with the field and um, well you might be maybe maybe you don't want to um, you know devote a few thousand dollars and uh, your time uh, going to a lecture every single day on an on-campus site. Maybe you want to listen to what I have to say here and um, understand whether or not you actually want to be in education. Well, if you want to be uh, in that situation and uh, watch this from the comfort of your own home, uh, at a nice college level course, get acquainted with the field, um, I'm also your guy here. So this is going to be the second lecture uh, in the series on differentiation. And so before we uh, get started here with differentiation, I just want to uh, briefly recap where we left off last week. And um, well, we'll get into um, the new stuff, right? So the, the crux of the issue here. All right, so where do we leave off last week? Uh, last week, we talked about a few things, um, one of which is, uh, is education right for you? Um, do you actually really want to be a teacher? And part of the way that you know that is just going through the courses and, and spending some time observing students and, and student teaching in general, right? Because the job is it's extreme. Like, if you don't really want to be a teacher, um, you probably shouldn't go into this field, right? It's a lot more stressful than people make it out to be. Um, you're going to be dealing with constant behavioral issues all the time. Uh, the pay is not necessarily the best, especially when you're starting out. Eventually, you know, the pay can be pretty good, right? But it's going to take you a while to get there, right? You have to put in your time. You have to get more education, right? And that's a stressful, long, tedious process, and maybe it doesn't always work out. Um, and maybe you're in a, a state that's extremely competitive. And so in the state of Ohio, for example, uh, despite what people say in terms of teacher shortages or, um, or the like, uh, we have uh, about 15 public school positions opened up every year for um, 7 through 12 social studies, right? That's where my licensure is at. And um, so I tend to keep uh, tabs on uh, that area of teaching or that uh, teaching job. So, wow, okay, you got 15 openings, right? Well, how many people are applying? 400, right? <laughs> yeah, so then you just got to step back. You're like, wow, I got to rewind that real quick. Got to double tap my screen, right? Did he just say 400 people are applying for 15 positions? It's like, yes, right? So, I mean, maybe you can get a job as a teacher in a private school or a, a charter school and, um, you know, there's, there's positives and negatives to doing that, uh, one of which is you get to be a, uh, a teacher, which is awesome, right? But in the same breath, if you really want to make a good living, uh, you got to get into the public schools, especially long term. And so, um, uh, well, uh, 15 jobs, 400 people, right? How do you differentiate, <laughs> well, there we go, this term's already up on the board, how you differentiate yourself uh, from everybody else? And, um, you know, how can you be the best teacher that people actually want to hire? And you think, too, like, well, 15 positions out of 400, it's like maybe if that sounds like good odds to you, just remember about half of those are going to go to somebody who was promised a job because uh, they have some connection. Uh, the, the wonderful saying, who you know is where you go, is extremely true in the field of education as it is anywhere else. Um, nepotism runs, uh, it's, it's thriving uh, very, very well. And so you want to make sure that you are um, on your game, right, because they're only going to hire the best. And so... Uh, well, uh, differentiation uh, is still uh, not yet to be covered because we have to talk about um, uh, teacher positions and um, uh, terminology. Uh, so you know, I really, really want to jump into this, but we got we to gotta talk about positions. Why is it important to understand teaching positions? Um, again, because there's a whole ecosystem of uh, teacher positions, or, or I mean, just not teacher positions, uh, just positions in the field of education. Right? There's a whole ecosystem, right? And if you don't understand what they do, then you can't collaborate with these people effectively. Um, or maybe you just bomb an interview question because you don't actually understand what they do. And so uh, let me give you an example here. Um, you know, uh, a resource officer, paraprofessional, uh, assistant principal. Do you really understand what they do or do you just understand what their title is, right? And, or you just have a general vague idea of what they do, right? Because these things, you're going to have to collaborate with these people all the time. And uh, if you're not collaborating effectively, um, you're going to have a very difficult time um, 
you know, just in terms of your teacher reviews, uh, just in terms of getting a job, because you have to have experience doing these things, right? That's what they want to hear. And if you, if you, and you can tell when people fake things, right? Um, obviously, lie detector tests aren't foolproof, right? Um, or the detection of people, which is even uh, less uh, uh, foolproof. Um, but the uh, you know, if, if you're going to interview and you start to fumble on things, you don't have any clear-cut examples of things, you have to really skirt around the question, um, well, they're not going to want to hire you because somebody else has done all that they possibly can to understand the relationship between these positions and actually, um, you know, work with these other individuals in the school's ecosystem. Um, so maybe an assistant principal, for example. What does an assistant principal do, right? I'll give you five seconds to think about it, or you can pause the video for that matter. One, two, three four, five, right? Now you think to yourself, okay, well, I have a nice definition of what an assistant principal does in my head, right? But if that definition did not include um, either, either, that's the key word, either discipline or uh, focusing on teacher development uh, and uh, academics, then you've already lost. <coughs> and um, you've already lost because there's two types of assistant principals at most schools, right? Some schools might be a little different. Maybe there's not always, uh, you know, two different assistant principals at, at schools, but generally speaking, there is. And um, the one on the academic side will focus on developing teachers, right? Getting them to better their instruction via differentiation. And um, the other type of, uh, 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 and so they're gonna focus on curriculum and whatnot. And then the other uh, type of uh, assistant principal is gonna focus on discipline, right? So referrals, contacting parents, right? Restorative practices, PBIS models, right? Uh, ways in which students do not repeat the uh, same antisocial behaviors again in the future. Right? How can you best foster that? Right? Because the, the idea is not necessarily to punish students um, for their actions. The idea is to give them some form of consequence um, so that they don't do it again in the future. Right? That's the whole essence behind what's known as PBIS. And so um, that's one of the big terms that we had in the uh, first lecture here. Uh, so. Uh, key positions, uh, very important to understand them. And uh, you can only make so much difference as a teacher. And now people will argue, and they're like, no, 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 no. I make the most difference as a teacher, right? I, I do all I can in the classroom. It's like, maybe you do, right? But you're still not changing necessarily the um, innate proclivities of your students, um, whether those have been nurtured into them or whether those are just you know, naturally bestowed upon them, or it's a mixture of both, which tends to be the case. Um, you know, uh, are you making the most difference? It's like, maybe you are for your uh, situation, but you got to remember, you are only one teacher that they're going to have throughout their life, right? And maybe let's say you're with them an hour a day at the middle school level, for example, right? They're, you know, they're, they're 14 years old, right? right? They've been alive for, let's calculate the number of hours, 14 times 24 times uh, uh, 365, right? That's the number of hours they've been alive, right? And now you come along, you're strutting on in there, and you say, okay, yes, but I'm going to be with you 180 hours throughout your entire life. And you think that's a big chunk, right? But when you're comparing 180 to thousands and thousands of hours, well, all of a sudden it's not so big. And, um, you know, so how do you make a difference? Well, you engage the other stakeholders, right? You engage the other uh, staff members. You engage the parents, right? You engage the community members. And all of a sudden, now you can expand your little one hour a day to eight hours a day. And you can expand it to the home and their home life another eight hours a day uh, with the community and, and, and the family. And so all of a sudden, now you're, you're targeting them 16 hours a day. You're making a big impact. And um, you do that over 13 years of education, uh, K through 12, even though education should be uh, pre-preschool all the way up to uh, 12th grade, but <laughs> who's counting, right? And um, so that, that, can, that can be a fun video, talking about the, um, uh, the importance of preschool, but we won't, we won't get into that today. Uh, so anyways, engaging people is extremely important, and you have to be willing to, willing to do it, and you have to be able to do it, right? And so um, that's one of the things that we talked about in the first uh, lecture. Um, and the other uh, thing that we talked about here uh, was key terms uh, for the field of education. And so um, there's a lot of terms in education, uh, as there is for any field for that matter, right? You go to business, you got a bunch of different terms. Um, and, you know, are, are you always going to use these terms? No, right? But you have to understand what they are, right? Because the last thing you want is to get into interview and be the deer in the headlights um, and then just look, um, well, I mean, you can imagine it, right? And so you don't want to, you don't want to be that person, right? You don't want to be that person, the last person you want to be and because you're not going to get the job. And then you're going to be wondering why you didn't get the job and you're going to think back to this moment and say, wow, I really should have understood what all these terms mean on the board in the first lecture, right? So you got to understand these and um, 
One of the terms today, or one of the concepts for that matter, is the concept of differentiation. And so finally, right, we're getting into the, uh, the, the main crux of the issue here, differentiation. Uh, what is differentiation? Um, how important uh, is uh, differentiation for uh, a teacher to, well, uphold? And uh, what are some examples of differentiation? And how could we take certain scenarios? So we have a bunch of case studies here, and we'll go through them one by one. How can we take certain scenarios and differentiate them um, to be the best lessons for their students or even better than they once were? Because right? maybe it's not the best lesson, but maybe um, it's better than what it was. Right? So differentiation. What is differentiation? Um, this is the first thing here. Uh, differentiation. What is a, a solid definition? Uh, well, here on the board, uh, teaching content in a manner that makes the most sense to individual or groups of students. All right, so that's one definition. I even got one here at the bottom, too, uh, for in conclusion. Uh, helps students understand content in accordance with their unique learning needs. All right, so anything that you're doing in any capacity, anything that you're doing in any capacity to help students is differentiation. And um, differentiation essentially means so much that it doesn't mean anything at all. Right? It's kind of like the word uh, environments is what I think I, I, I said last week. I, can't, I cannot for the life of me remember where I heard that word. Uh, I don't know if it was I don't know, maybe Plowman, uh, Robert Plowman, genetics researcher, or maybe it was, um, uh, I don't know, like Sapolsky or something. I cannot remember for the life of me where I heard that term. But differentiation, uh, God, it means so, so much. Right? So when you get uh, confused in your teacher courses or, or wherever, or you hear the word differentiation, you think to yourself, there has to be some specific method um, to the madness here. What, what it, there has to be something that you do every single time uh, to differentiate a lesson, right? That's not the case, right? Differentiation is so open-ended that you can do anything and it's considered differentiation. Now, having said that, right, there are generally accepted best practices in the field of education uh, for differentiation, right? So you wouldn't, do, you wouldn't do a lecture every day if one student enjoys a lecture. Right? You just wouldn't do it. Right? Lectures tend to be a pretty bad way to engage students. Now, some people like lectures. The people who are watching this video, for example, you guys like lectures because right? you're watching this. Right? You want to learn things fast. You want to learn things in a way where you can just vibe out, listen to the lecture, have a good time. Maybe you're driving. Maybe you're walking. Maybe you're running. You want to do something. You want to learn uh, on the go. Maybe you want to I just sit down, have some popcorn, listen to the lecture. But you enjoy it. You love hearing about the topic. Um, it's engaging to you. You're enthralled in it. Um, but for most people, that's not the case. And, th and that's no different for students, right? If you have a student who only likes math and you're trying to talk to them about history, they don't care, right? And maybe you can make the best lecture uh, possible. Um, but still, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for them to get engaged with it. So lectures are very good for uh, engaging people who already have some you know, big interest in a uh, certain area. Right? But for everybody else, it tends to be um, pretty lacking, even though you can get a lot of information put forth quickly. Um, and so if you're going to do lectures, you want to tend to limit it to a certain uh, time limit uh, throughout classes. So maybe you do it for 15 minutes and you don't do it for a whole hour. Right? So that's uh, something to take into consideration here. Um, but that's a practice that... Look, most people are going to frown upon you know, when you get into the field of education. Um, but now you take another pr practice, such as um, project-based learning here. We've got some examples here in this big chart. Uh, one of the examples here is project-based learning, right? Do people, people love project-based learning, right? You have no idea how much people love project-based learning. I mean, you just even say the word, they start salivating out of their mouths. They love it so much, right? And um, understandably so, because project-based learning tends to be the things that students enjoy the most, right? And it, and it gives them some real-world applicable skills, right? Or school, uh, skills with real-world applicability. And uh, it also uh, gives them a tangible product in a lot of cases um, for things that they can show or demonstrate or put in some portfolio. Um, so if you're a high school, right, one of the things you should, that you should be doing, ideally, would be having students create some portfolio of things that they've done to acquire some technical skills. Um, it could be something as simple as making a website. And it sounds difficult to make a website, but believe me, it's not that difficult. Um, you can guide your students through it um, with the uh, right attitude. Um, and so we have a number of different examples of differentiation. Again, it means so much that there's no one right answer. It's not like every single time uh, you want to differentiate something, right? You say, oh, man, I got to figure out how to use technology in my classroom. It's like, no, that's not, no, that's not differentiation. Differentiation could be technology, right? It could be technology. It could be rubrics. It could be classroom layout. It could be demonstrations, verbal assessments, games, documentaries, inquiry-based learning. There's a number of different things that... Uh, 
you know, differentiation could be. And so you have to understand um, that it's really everything here. And so I, I cannot stress that enough because if you go into a job interview, right, and you have people asking you how do you differentiate for your students, right, because that's going to be one of the questions, right? Well, then you have to know how to answer this question, right? And you have to know some of the best practices. So um, what are some examples? Uh, you can look up in the chart here. Uh, Project-based learning, PBL, right? So uh, we'll just cover through... Uh, in depth here, what are some of these uh, examples? What do they mean? Uh, PBL, uh, project-based learning, right? You want to give students a project, right, to complete, right? Now you can scaffold that, right? So you could uh, make it more, uh, uh, you can give them more or less help depending on their needs, right? Give them some structure and then they try to build onto it. Um, so you're scaffolding, you're guiding them along in their instruction. Uh, and, uh, you know, you want to create some tangible product and uh, make sure there's like some real world applicability, right? Um, so for example, if you are a, uh, history teacher, maybe you do some online project with uh, uh, biographies on the websites like we talked about, right? And the reason you might do that is because you want to give them some skills for making a website. So maybe they go into the job and maybe they're at some little mom and pop shop and they want to make a website for their company, right? So they can uh, better, the, better themselves, right? Or maybe something for their, their own company, right? Maybe they want to start a, a landscaping business, for example, right? Um, and they need a website, right? Something basic too. It doesn't have to even be like a shop, right? Just something that tells you the you know, the prices of things and you can make a call and show you some uh, finished products of the, uh, the, you know, the lawns that you've mowed and, and trimmed and, and, and planted flowers in and whatnot or mulched, right? And so uh, project-based uh, learning, right? Um, next up, we got culture of relevant teaching, uh, CRT. Um, people, uh, when they hear culturally relevant teaching, um, uh, they love it, right? Because it's one of the big pushes nowadays in education. You want to relate things back to the culture of the students. And um, understandably so, um, relating things back to the culture of students is extremely important because um, they tend to have a very good interest in uh, their cultures, right? And so um, uh, let's say you have a Puerto Rican student, for example, and you can relate things back to um, some famous person from Puerto Rico. Um, well, they're going to love that, right? And so maybe they're from, uh, I don't know, the Ukraine, right? Or maybe they're from uh, uh, Great Britain or wherever. It doesn't really matter where. Maybe they're from the United States for that matter, right? It doesn't really matter where they're at. Um, culture, love, and teaching. So relating things back to culture, uh, they tend to love that because it's a very engaging topic for a lot of people. They love to talk about their heritage. Um, and um, I've never been a, a person big on uh, talking about like heritage for myself personally, but people tend to love it, right? But here's the thing where people most get... <laughs> people uh, get tripped up the most, right? They think that culturally relevant teaching is just talking about cultures. That's not actually true. Culturally relevant teaching, uh, contrary to popular belief, is actually um, the differentiation of teaching methods um, to teach to the interest of students, right? Now, <laughs> differentiation in general is kind of that whole concept, but it's a little bit more specific than that. Um, so let's say you have a student uh, who loves hockey, for example. Um, hockey is a good example of something that I've talked about in the past. Um, all right, they love hockey, right? They're a big hockey fan, and um, you can talk about, you're talking about friction, right? And um, one of the things I did in my class before in the past, because uh, I used to be a science teacher, was I, um, I, I would run across my class, and I would try to slide, right? And I would, like, I'd fall and wipe out, right? And the kids, they get all excited, they, they get interested in it. And, um, uh, but they, it goes to show, right, you got this floor, right? You can slide a f maybe a foot or two, and then you face plant, right? But if you were on the ice, there's less friction. There's less friction on the ice. And so uh, you can slide farther, you can slide longer, but you're relating things back to the interest of students. And um, that's, well, culture of the relevant teaching in a nutshell. Uh, next up, we have inquiry-based learning, IBL. Uh, it's a newer form of teaching, in, in my opinion, not necessarily. Even people have been doing it probably for thousands of years, um, but it, the, the the term itself, it just feels newer, right? I don't know why. There's something about this term uh, where people hear it and they're just like, wow, that's cutting edge right there. I, I don't, don't uh, question me on that, but I swear it's the case. Um, so inquiry-based learning, what is inquiry-based learning? Uh, inquiry-based learning is um, getting students to question things, right? And then follow up on those questions and answer them, right? So if you have a student who's asking questions about history, right, and you don't know the answer, get them to uh, you know, research that answer. Or maybe you have an exit slip and you say, okay, well, think of one question about history that we haven't talked about, right? And then go search it up on Google, find the answer, and write it down, right? It's like your writing prompt for the day, 
right? Um, that's an example of inquiry-based learning. You're getting students to question things, right? Challenge ideas, question things, and then examine them. Uh, so inquiry-based learning. Uh, multimodal instruction. Uh, so you're engaging multiple different senses of students. So touch, taste, sound, right? Um, you know, multi uh, sight, right? Multimodal instruction. And so, like a good example of this would be uh, an audiobook, for instance, right? Um, you don't just give them an audiobook, right? You give them an audiobook uh, and the text itself. So, multimodal instruction, right? So they can see it and they can listen to it. Um, really helps your ELL learners, uh, your English language learners, and um, that's going to be uh, very beneficial. Uh, audiobooks in general, right? So they can, uh, get, they can hear the words um, in addition to reading them. Uh, documentaries. Um, you know, people oftentimes, I, this is one thing I found super weird as a history teacher, um, because I learned a lot of what I know about history from documentaries, right? And it's a great way. There's, there's thousands of them online. There's no shortage of them, right? They're easily accessible. Um, and people devote hundreds and hundreds of hours, right, to making these documentaries, tens of hours at the least, right? And then people have the audacity to say, well, that's not a great way to teach. It's like, people have devoted that much time and, and energy, to these documentaries, and you think that they're not worth it to show to students, that never made any sense to me at all, right? So documentaries, while people say to use them sparingly, um, if you find the right documentaries, and you know sometimes there's documentaries that maybe you don't want to show, um, but if you find the right ones, um, there can be a great tool uh, to differentiate the uh, lesson. Um, simulations, uh, so you're trying to simulate something. So maybe you have a, uh, well, a good example of this would be like driving. Right, a driving simulator. Um, some schools in the country, not all of them, uh, they will actually have um, the ability for students to get their driver's license throughout through high school. And um, these uh, students, they might do a simulated, uh, you know, they might have, be, have a, si a simulation of a car. Right, so they sit down, they got the seat, they got the seatbelt on, right, they got the, the steering wheel, like a real steering wheel, and they got some program where they can drive throughout traffic, right, and learn how to how to drive, right. But it's, it's a simulation, right. So it's not going to be like you know, uh, NASCAR, or like, um, uh, what is it, Need for Speed, Most Wanted or something, right? But, you know, you're, 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 you can drive a car that's you know, relatively realistic, something that, like, um, well, I don't know, well, like those programs would use. So that's a simulation. Uh, group work is another good example here. Um, so if, uh, you know, you, students love group work. They love talking to each other. And, you know, sometimes you want to stray away from group work, right, because um, students just want to talk to their friends. But other times, group work can be extremely beneficial, right, because it's collaborative, um, people love to work with others and um, it teaches them how to work with others um, if you are uh, doing group work effectively. And, um, you know, so you, you tell them, uh, well, we've got to be respectful of everybody. Everybody's got to contribute. And uh, maybe you could even structure it as a teacher, scaffold it, structure, scaffold, and kind of the same word there, synonyms in some regards, um, that uh, group work so that way they, everybody's contributing and they learn to work with one another. Or maybe you teach them to delegate responsibilities and make sure that's one of the things that they are doing. And maybe they got a worksheet on that, right? So um, everybody has a certain part that they have to do. And uh, if they don't do that certain part, then maybe you do some form of like anonymous um, polling as to whether or not they did, and then you can take off points for people who didn't. Now, you got to be careful with that, and you got to be walking around as a teacher yourself to know whether or not people are participating, because you don't just want somebody to bully, to some, bully somebody and not give them points for it um, by saying, well, they didn't do any work even though they did. Um, but, you know, uh, group work could be a great thing. Uh, so rubrics, uh, again, you're quantifying or uh, putting a number to expectations. Right? So you're saying, okay, well, you completed uh, three out of four parts of uh, the question, so therefore you're going to get, uh, of the opinion question, so therefore you're going to get 75%, uh, right? And where, whereas if you did two out of four, then you're going to get 50%, right? But it's, it's, it's a lot more, um, it's a lot less subjective, right? Or maybe there's, there's written out expectations, so you have to make eye contact during your presentation. Right, a rubric just it states that expectation, and it gives um you know different uh a different quantification for different point ranges. Right, so maybe you say one point is you stare down at your paper the entire time and you only looked up once. Right, two points is uh, you uh, were giving you made lots of eye contact with students um, throughout the presentation. You, you weren't entirely looked down. Uh, you made eye contact at least like five or six times. Uh, the next time is you made eye contact. Uh, more than 80% of the time, uh, so you're reading down, but you're looking at the same time. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, all the points is you have constant, right, eye, eye contact. You're maintaining eye contact the entire time. Something like that, a rubric. Um, a lot of us are familiar with these for a lot of our assignments. Uh, exit slips. Uh, exit slips are great. This is a little something that you can uh, use as a teacher um, to uh, formally assess or gather some data on your students. And... Um, 
exit slips are, you know, they're walking out the door, they hand you a little slip, they get some nice easy points for it, you can understand how much they really gathered from a lesson. Uh, so great little thing, uh, helps them wind down uh, before they go on to the halls. Uh, games, uh, people love games, right? Now games are, uh, I use games all the time. And uh, games are very, very, very good for uh, teaching facts, but they're not necessarily good for teaching concepts. And the literature is extremely clear on that. And so um, if you are going to use games, it's going to be a little bit less applicable to things such as math, um, but it will be more applicable to things such as science or uh, history. Um, so games. Uh, then you got verbal assessments, right? So they're going to express their knowledge verbally as opposed to writing it down. Um, just you're differentiating. It sounds small, right? But that's, look, you're, you're changing education to make it more interesting or to meet the needs of your students, right? That's differentiation. Practical assessments, right? So, um, ooh, a good practical assessment would be something along the lines of you have some, uh, let's say you have uh, a career technical program, right? You have students who are um, uh, supposed to, what's a really good one here? Uh, they're in an automotive program, right? And you could have a, uh, uh, an assessment where they have to change a tire. And if they can't practically change a tire, like maybe they know how to do it in theory, right? But if they can't actually do it, right? Then they fail the practical assessment, right? And um, then you're gonna try to devise a strategy moving forward to get them to pass that and learn how to change a tire. Um, so next up, we got manipulatives. All right, now manipulatives are uh, essentially the uh, use of uh, objects that are less that, are, that makes learning less abstract for students, right? So abstract is sort of out there. You got to think about it, right? Um, intellectually, there there is nothing tangible. Uh, so for example, uh, three plus three is equal to six. Three plus three is equal to six. Now, we can do that in our heads, but maybe you're a first grader. Three plus three is equal to six, right? The student can't understand that. They don't know what that means, right? But now you take little blocks. You take six blocks. You say one, two, three, it's three blocks here, right? And you got one, two, three, three blocks here. Three, three, right? And then you say three, in addition to this three is six, right? So you put them together, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? So now they can uh, visualize things a little bit easier. Um, lectures, uh, lectures can be a great tool, right? People will get so hung up on lectures, man. They hate lectures. Um, but lectures can be very beneficial depending on, uh, you know, the, um, the, 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 for one, the person who's giving the lecture uh, or the amount of time that you're devoting to them. Uh, readings of choice. Um, so you allow students to pick. You allow them to differentiate the lesson for themselves. So you don't even got to do it, right? So maybe you uh, tell them, well, just you pick an article uh, that you're interested in about um, uh, uh, World War II, right? And so they could pick any topic on all of World War II. Any topic, right? And that's their decision, right? And they're, so they're differentiated themselves. Maybe they got to summarize it or something, right? And so um, readings of choice, uh, classroom layout, right? Uh, you know, how are you going to organize your classroom so that there's the, the least amount of behavioral uh, uh, or antisocial behavior um, present in your class, right? How are you differentiating that? Um, or is the seating chart going to be different? Is your cabinets going to be different? Is um, where you teach on the board going to be different? Maybe there's a couple boards in your classroom. Maybe you can change that up. Um, how are you going to make the walkway and entrance of your classroom uh, conducive to kids not just hanging around? Um, or maybe uh, or where's the pencil sharpener at, right? You know, I swear to God, there's this one thing I've been wanting to coin for a while, and I'm going to write a paper on it, um, is the pencil sharpener effect, right? And um, I just think it's so hilarious, right? You have a pencil sharpener in the room, everybody wants to stand up, right? And they always want to sharpen their pencil, right? They don't even need to sharpen their pencil. They just want to sharpen it just so they can stand up and just be out of their seat, Right? It makes no sense to me, but people love it. Right? So uh, pencil sharpener effect, the pencil sharpener effect. Right? So seating chart, uh, classroom layout sort of go hand in hand. Uh, graphic organizers, right? so you're getting them to uh, you know, make connections to different ideas uh, or different concepts. Uh, easy, nice, easy way of doing that, graphic organizer, as opposed to just writing it out. Uh, interactive assignments, right? so they're interacting with things. Uh, maybe they have a worksheet. Uh, or, or you know, even better, let's say you're using a software right, that, that tailors itself to the level of your students, right? So you have, uh, you're in seventh grade, 
right? And you have students who are at a third grade level, so they're getting third grade questions, right? And then maybe every uh, few questions or so, there's uh, some game, for example. And uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, progress in the game or um, what you get in the game is contingent upon how many questions you answer correctly, right? So it's giving them somewhat of a brain break, and it's also um, it's making it interactive. Um, or maybe you have something like a video, for example, and um, there's like pauses in the video, and maybe that video uh, requires you to answer, right? So it's an interactive assignment, and maybe you get a score at the end, like a little quiz. So that way you, you, were, had, you had to pay attention, you had to answer the questions correctly. And throughout, to, in order to progress to the end of the video, otherwise you don't get points. Um, so the next up, we got translation software. Uh, so if you're an uh, English language learner, an ELL speaker, um, or ELL student, I mean, uh, then you're going to want to obviously translate your assignments, right? Because you don't speak the language, right? Um, so maybe they can use that individually themselves, or you can do it as a teacher for them. Um, or you can make the option available. Like I think there's one thing on, um, I think it's Word, for example. Um, it is uh, the immersive, immersive reader. Uh, maybe I got the name wrong, but Immersive something, Immersive Reader, I think, and uh, basically translates software in real time for students, right? Um, a great little tool, right? Or Google Translate, something easy, right? Uh, virtual field trips. Um, one of the field trips that I've done virtually is a, a tour of the Roman Colosseum. And you think to yourself, well, yeah, you can walk around and look at it on the street. It's like, no, you can actually go inside of the Roman Colosseum on Google Maps, right, with Google Street View. So it's very, very interesting. Uh, people tend to enjoy it a lot. Students love it. They love just exploring, playing around with it. Um, but what does that do, a virtual field trip, right? Not only are they seeing a historical landmark, right, making connections to it from the theory, in or, uh, from the theory into uh, the real world, um, but they're also, it's free, for one, <laughs> that's, that's a big thing right there. Um, it's getting them to use technology, uh, use technolog technological tools. Um, and so it's so vital to do things like virtual field trips as a historian uh, or a history teacher because um, you, know, you can show them things that they otherwise would not be able to see. Right? Because it's not like we're all going to go to Rome, right? look at the Roman Colosseum, but uh, you could look at it from the comfort of your own classroom. And uh, it can be almost just as effective. So uh, anyways, uh, technology. Uh, obviously, right, you want to use technology as much as you can, get acquainted with it, uh, learn how to type, for example, a very nice, important skill, uh, learn how to um, make websites, PowerPoints, uh, Word, Excel, uh, Google Drive, right, um, Google Sheets, um, the whole Google Suite for that matter, um, little applications and software, learn how to use Google just to look up information. Right? Or even now, we're getting into the point in, in history where we can talk about AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, one of the things that I've used a, uh, a lot this year uh, was uh, ChatGPT when it came out, ChatGPT3. And um, uh, you can make worksheets uh, with little stories for reading comprehension, as I taught a writing class. And um, God, it's, it's, so, it's so easy to use. And it takes some time on behalf of the teacher. It's not as easy as people think, right? Because you still got to format everything. You got to check it through. And sometimes there might be a mistake. And the level's not the highest, you know, but middle school level. Um, some people say early high school. It depends on how you define that. Um, I'd say, you know, relatively solid middle school level assignments, right? So you say, ChatGPT, create a story on um, uh, an apple picking adventure, right? It'll create a whole story. Say, make it longer, make it longer, make it longer, make it more detailed, make it more detailed. Right? And it'll give you this nice detailed story right? and say, add four characters into the story and, re and redo it. Right? It'll do that. Right? And um, you know, then you can you know, copy and paste that uh, into, into a document, for example. And then you can say, OK, well, now ChatGPT, make 10 multiple choice questions, uh, find 10 vocabulary words for that, and uh, make four extended response questions, too. Right? And then you make a big packet. Right? You've got to check through everything, obviously. And um, look, uh, it would be a great thing for you know, students to just get acquainted with finding information in the text. Right? And um, you know, con uh, thinking critically about the text um, at like the middle school level, for example. So very, very important to use technology on your end, um, as well as students. Right? So maybe uh, by the time they get to high school, uh, 12th grade, like I think personally, it would be a crime not to show them about artificial intelligence. Right? Um, you know, even if you know, maybe there's some qualms about it. So you don't want to show them it before they get to 12th grade. But maybe uh, when they get to 12th grade, you say, hey, look. Because uh, you want them to know how to do things on their own, right? But once they get twelfth grade, say, "Look, there's also this tool, by the way, right? That can help you out a lot, right? And um, that's ChatGPT or any artificial intelligence software, for that matter." Uh, demonstrations. Uh, demonstrations is pretty cool. Uh, so you got some science project um, you want to demonstrate in front of students. For example, um, uh, one thing that I did and let students do as well uh, was 
uh, you crush up cereal and you extract the iron from it, right? So you, you crush up the cereal, nice little fine powder, pour some water into it, you smoosh it around for a little bit, let it sit for a minute, right? And then you take uh, ma some magnets and you just go around very, very slowly. And you'll see the little pieces of iron uh, that you can, um, or the iron uh, shavings or whatever you want to call them. Uh, iron fragments, I don't necessarily know the iron filings. Uh, little pieces of iron from the cereal. Right, and that's what we're eating. You can connect it to minerals. You can connect it to mineral usage. Uh, so pretty interesting stuff. Uh, so those are lots of examples of differentiation. Um, obviously, uh, there's way more than this. Pretty much anything that you do is an example of differentiation. All the students like it, and they're benefiting from it. Um, so yeah. All right, so why is differentiation needed slash important? Well, all students are unique. Every single student is unique, and it will align with student interest, right? So um, students have different needs, right? Maybe some students need that audiobook to go along with the, with the text, right? Because they don't speak English, right? And like, yeah, they could read it and benefit from that, right? But if you can connect the word to the reading as well, then they can sort of equate the word um, with sounds too. So, that's, so that way they can understand, uh, understand it when they hear it and when they see it. Um, so, you know, something like that. Uh, all unique, right? Uh, aligns with student interest. Uh, students are going to love it. Uh, if you do it properly. Lots of different ways you can make your lessons very engaging and fun for them. Uh, and then how do you differentiate? Well, you got to know your students via anecdotal experience and data. Uh, know your students via anecdotal experience and data. Uh, okay, so look, we can't quantitatively assess students on every little thing that they do. Right? We take too much time, too much effort, too much energy. Uh, even if you want to do it, it's simply not possible. You can't quantify everything. Right? Um, so you got to just understand them as individuals, right? And it's, that's just by interacting with them in general, gathering your own data that's anecdotal. Um, and then you got uh, hard quantitative data, right? And that's going to be like your formative assessments, which we haven't talked about yet. We will have a whole lecture on data, right? Data is extremely important, and they love to hear it in interviews too, because it's extremely because you have to guide your instruction with data. If you're not following the data, then you're not teaching right. And so on, um, data. Uh, you can get that from a formative assessment, which is something that's like you know pretty small. Um, it's not as comprehensive. Um, then you can get it from a summative assessment, right? Um, which is like a nice benchmark test, the end of unit exam, for example. Uh, and then you can you know can look at where students are struggling, uh, where they're excelling at, and then you can tailor your instruction accordingly. If, if everybody's struggling with a certain uh, topic, um, then you go back and teach it or reteach it in a different manner. Um, so data, extremely important. It's sort of going to guide your instruction, tell you how to differentiate. Right? If you know every single time that you allow group work to happen, students create absolutely terrible uh, presentations, well, then it probably makes sense not to do group work again, right? Um, or uh, do it very, very sparringly or minimally. Um, but if, you, if students, they excel, they do group work, and um, you know, it's one thing that they not only they love, but they also do way better work with the group work, well, then maybe it makes sense to incorporate that a little bit more into your teaching, right? Differentiate uh, a little bit more with that. Uh, next up, we're going to have uh, let students decide slash student-centered learning. Uh, so that's going to be uh, you let students pick something, right? And so I, I can't remember the, the exact example that we talked about here, but um, uh, yes, it was an article, right? You let students pick any article that they want, or they can be doing a biography on any person that they want, right, for the uh, website. Or maybe they can pick how to do the presentation. They can do a PowerPoint. They can just do a, vor a verbal presentation. They can do a poster. Uh, they can do a... Hey, hey, a PDF like I'm doing, right? Um, or anything, right? So that we can display the information and effectively communicate it to everybody else in their class, right? Um, so uh, uh, know your students via anecdotal experience and data. Let them decide. And that's known as student-centered learning, right? You give them a hand. Uh, you give them a, a voice in their, uh, teach in their, um, in their learning, Right? So you're, you're engaging them as stakeholders, right? as people who are also involved in their own education. Right? Because look, they are the person who, who's getting the education. They should be involved in it to some degree. Right? And so you let them differentiate it themselves. Right? Sometimes they know what's best for them. Maybe you've got a student who just wants to, uh, I don't know, maybe they just want to work independently, for example. Maybe they should be allowed to do that. Right? So maybe they're not forced to go into a group. Um, but having said that, sometimes they should be because they've got to know how to collaborate with people. Right, so it's a fine line, right? but you, you get to know your students. You get to examine the data a little bit, and you should be able to uh, effectively differentiate. Uh, next up, pitfalls of differentiation. Uh, so it takes time and responsibility uh, on behalf of the teacher. right? And uh, not all students will be happy with every differentiation method. Right? So look, it takes time to differentiate. right? And it's a lot harder to just you know, do something that's not just a lecture or give them a worksheet every single day. 
um, you know, to do projects and make ones that they're actually like and enjoy and they want to engage with and, and they're going to create tangible products for and there's real world applicability um, and, and they can communicate these results to, that's going to be difficult to construct these things and it's going to take time on behalf of the teacher, right? Because there's 180 days in a class, right? And maybe you're teaching more than one class, which you oftentimes will be teaching more than one class, right? So that's a lot of, uh, you know, lessons to come up with, right, that are interesting and engaging and to teach the concept too. So it can't just be interesting and engaging, it also has to teach the concept, right? So, God, it's extremely complex and so time and responsibility on behalf of the teacher, you got to use your time effectively when you're a teacher, right? You can't just be messing around and expecting the best results to come uh, to fruition. Uh, you really got to be, um, God, you really got to be on your game, right? So uh, differentiation. Uh, not all students will be happy with every differentiation method, right? Uh, look, you're going to have students who, they don't, they don't enjoy group work. They hate group work, right? But um, it's a skill that you need to foster anyways. And sometimes uh, a lot of students will enjoy group work. Most students, in fact, will enjoy group work, right? So even though you've got some students who might not enjoy it, uh, most of them might, right? That's something to take into consideration. Or maybe there's a skill that outweighs that they need to learn. Um, so yeah, you know, not everybody's going to be happy with it. Um, and it will take a lot of time, right? And sometimes teachers don't have time, right? Maybe you only got one planning period, right? How are you supposed to plan for two or three classes when you only got one planning period, right? That's 15 minutes of class. Uh, miss, or say, so you got an hour planning, right? Um, you got three classes, 20 minutes of class, right? You got to go to the bathroom, there's another five minutes. You got to go to the office, another five minutes. Right? I got 50 minutes divided by three, whatever that is, I don't know, 17 and a half minutes, right? Um, look, I mean, you're not really, or 17 minutes, 16 and a half minutes, something like that. Um, you're not, you don't really got time to do everything, right? And uh, you also got to prepare for the next class too, if there's just one after it, right? Um, or some supervisory duty. Like, it's just, time is not on your side. It's not your friend as a teacher, Right? And so you got to be willing to uh, you know, go above and beyond um, sometimes to create the best lessons or uh, potentially cataloging them for years and years to come. Right? So if you're a teacher for 30 years, right, maybe every single week you make sure you get one really good lesson in there. And then by the end of five years, now you've got really good lessons all the time. Right? And so that's just something to think about and take into consideration. Uh, so next up here, we got case studies. Right? What are some case studies? Uh, uh, for education, um, we're going to give a scenario, and you guys are going to have to, uh, you know, think of ways in which you can uh, differentiate the scenario, right? So, um, let's take a sip of my water here. The little watertight seal actually just came off. Can you believe that? Um, put that back in there. Okay. Uh, anyways, you guys are going to have to think of ways to differentiate. Uh, via these case studies here. So now, there's no right or wrong answer for these, right? Because you don't have a set of students, right? But just think to students that you worked with in the past um, as a student teacher or a student observer or um, uh, maybe even your own scenario for that matter or your own situation. Think of you as a, as a, as a student, right? How would you best want to be taught? How could you make the lesson better as a teacher um, for yourself or others or um, and the like? So uh, we'll go one by one here. I'm, I labeled them open-ended and narrower, right? Because if it's open-ended, you can sort of do anything. But if it's narrower, then you're going to have to figure out how to differentiate something that's already your... Because you, you have to do something, right? All right, it's already defined, right? How do you make it more differentiated than it already is? Um, so we'll go one by one here. Now, you guys can pause the video. I'd recommend it. Um, just think of ways in which you can, one by one, but without me telling you, right? So think of ways that you can do this, right? Because if you get this in an interview... And they're like, hey, look, we got a scenario for you. How, how would you differentiate this? All right, and you're like a deer in the headlights, right? Because you only listened to what I had to say and you didn't do it yourself. Then you're going to have a tough time. But maybe you do want to just listen to what I have to say here. So pause the video. Don't pause it. It's up to you. But, uh, well, we'll give you some examples here. So case study one, open-ended, right? Uh, a lesson that helps to teach the First Amendment. How could you differentiate that, Right? Well, a, a nice example that comes to mind for me is uh, you could host a debate, right? And as the, the person uh, hosting the debate, which is you, the teacher, right, you can silence certain people, right, and say, wow, I really like what you have to say. You're no longer allowed to speak. Go sit over there in the corner, right? That's, now their, their freedom of speech has been stripped from them. Or you can say, okay, well, you guys can talk about anything besides um, uh, protesting, right? Or uh, uh, about, uh, any, you talk about anything besides um, talking about uh, uh, con uh, I don't know. Um, uh, what, what, talk, you can talk about anything besides um, issues that are very um, conflicting, very um, controversial. That's the word. 
Uh, so look, you can differentiate in that regard, right? A debate is a very good one here. Um, lesson helps to teach the First Amendment. You could maybe have them do a, uh, a project on famous First Amendment cases. Or maybe you could have them, hey, you can have them do case studies right here. And, and um, you could have them uh, come up with solutions in different uh, groups. And each group can present a different um, uh, solution to a certain scenario. Or maybe you can have different groups with different scenarios present their solutions to them right, via the First Amendment or um, uh, why it would be beneficial to have it or not to have it. Right? They're going to take a stance. Um, so differentiate it in that regards, First Amendment. Uh, case study two, this is a little bit more narrower. right? Uh, you plan on reading a book in class. Right, you plan on reading a book in class. How can you differentiate that? Well, you can give the audio to the book, an audio book. Um, that's one way. Um, you can have uh, a PDF version online so students can follow along using technology. Uh, you can have, uh, again, the immersive reader uh, so students can have translation software uh, translating for them in real time uh, while they're reading along. Uh, or they can just listen along and follow along in English um, so they become more acquainted with the words. Uh, you could have... Um, uh, dictionaries open. Uh, you could have uh, Google open for um, uh, definitions. Um, lots of different ways uh, you can differentiate uh, reading a book in class and then let alone all the lessons that you can do about the book, right? So I mean, God, there's so many different things you can do with case studies, uh, number two. Uh, case study three, uh, you plan on lecturing to students about the Civil War and want them to take notes. Um, how can you differentiate the taking of notes, right? People tend to think, well, it's just, you know, pretty boring, right? Uh, you're going to have to just get through it. Um, that's not necessarily the case. Um, might often be the case, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, how can you differentiate the taking of notes? Well, imagine that uh, you were to have a PowerPoint that uh, is online uh, via a software called Nearpod, wink, wink, and um, you were to have every few slides, there'll be some uh, little thing they have to interact with. Right? And maybe they have to, uh, so that way it's, it's a question about um, the topic that was covered uh, in the PowerPoint. Um, so that way they're, they're actively engaged. And maybe you have a fill in the blank notes, right? So really students, should, ideally, students should just be listening to what you have to say and not writing notes too. Because if they're writing notes, then they're just going to be distracted and they're not really listening to what you have to say. Um, so uh, maybe you want to hand them the notes. Form of differentiation itself, which even sounds crazy, right? Um, but you know, there's lots of different ways uh, to differentiate in, in a scenario where you're giving notes. Um, you could have people come on up, right? Or you could call on people throughout the, the lecture, right? Uh, to you know, get their take on things, right? Uh, anyways, uh, case study four, students will complete biographies on famous historical figures. Uh, so again, you could do this online, you could do it with a poster, you could do this in group work, uh, you could allow them to pick the uh, person with the biography, student center learning. Um, they're gonna differentiate it themselves. Uh, the historical figures, um, you could even have little scenarios about the historical figures themselves, different questions about them that are very unique, right? So how does this, what is their lasting impact? Um, and uh, have you, uh, can you contact any of their descendants today to talk about them? That's a famous person, right? Like say George Washington's ancestors, right? Um, look, plenty of different things you can do. Uh, case study five, open-ended. A lesson on the Roman Colosseum. Uh, uh, lesson on the Roman Colosseum. Again, a virtual field trip is a good example for this one. Uh, but there's lots of different things that you can do. Jeez. Uh, um, well, a virtual field trip is a solid one to talk about. We already covered this one in depth. Uh, case study six, open-ended. Uh, students need to know the properties of different minerals. Right? They need to know the properties of different minerals. Right? Um, why is that? Uh, how can you differentiate that? Right? They got to know something. Right? Well, think about a game, for example. Right? You can have a bunch of games, and there's some great games out there. One that I tend to use all the time is called Blook It. And um, Blook It is a little bit better than Kahoot, right? Because Kahoot is a little bit more, you got to be on top of students, and not everybody's going to be wanting to engage, right? And so with Blook It, though, there are going to be a lot of people who want to engage, and they can engage faster at their own pace with Blook It. And um, they can compete against one another, right? So you're adding competition to the mix, which has been proven uh, to uh, foster uh, higher levels of engagement and, um, well, I guess academic learning uh, as a result of that. Uh, so you got uh, private different minerals via games. That's a great way. Uh, you can have them look it up, present it via poster, right? You a lot of, a lot of basic things, right? You could uh, uh, have actual uh, experiments, right? So that maybe they test the... Um, uh, Maybe they test um, certain minerals' as properties, right? So you take a, a different gemstones, or maybe you take different rocks, right? You test their streak, for example, or their hardness, right? You can you do a little uh, test or whatnot, and um, 
hopefully to come to some nice conclusions. They can conceptualize things a little bit better. They're less abstract. Uh, case study seven, open-ended. Uh, students need to know their multiplication table. Uh, manipulatives is a great thing, right? So you can, again, take the blocks, right? And um, they can, uh, I believe I've, I'm almost positive I got manipulatives right, but it sounds so easy that it doesn't even sound right. Um, so if I do got that wrong, um, well, hey, we could even look up the answer, right? Let's look up uh, what manipulatives is in class together, right? Um, so you take uh, manipulatives, you know what? Let me just, I'm right. All right, so you take manipulatives, you got the blocks, right? One, two, three, one, two, three, you put them together, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Manipulatives, uh, multiplication table, right? You could have them do games again, right? So one times one equal to one. One times zero is equal to zero. Seven times seven is equal to 49. Eight times eight is equal to 64. And they got a game with 100 questions, right? And they constantly repeat these over and over again. Flashcards. Right, as another way. Uh, maybe you have them uh, do some uh, game, right? So you have students line up on both ends of the classroom, right? And uh, you got uh, an answer on the board. And um, uh, for different facts, maybe you got like 30 answers on the board. And the first student to come up and slap the answer, right? And then go back and tag their teammate is the one who gets the points, right? And maybe you guys compete for some prize. Um, so you're differentiating in that regards, right? So you're adding a prize, an incentive, a positive incentive to perform well on these multiplication tables into the mix, right? So maybe you got something along the lines of uh, um, a treat, for example, or a, a, a movie day uh, for the winning, or no, extra credit for the, for the group, right? Or maybe if everybody does uh, scores over a certain uh, amount of points, maybe uh, you get somewhat like, like a, a half movie day or something, or movie day. Um, something that they can look forward to, right? Uh, so, or maybe they're allowed to work in a group, for instance. Um, so anyways, uh, got another multiplication table. Lots of ways to differentiate that. Uh, case study eight, a little bit more narrow. Uh, students need to create a website about a, a historical landmark. Um, well, uh, they could uh, uh, be able to pick the landmark that they do it on. Um, that's one. Maybe they could pick the society uh, that the landmark is in. Um, they could uh, pick uh, some of the, the prompts that they want to uh, assess about the historical landmark, or they could uh, ask questions about the landmark, inquiry-based learning, and then assess those questions about the landmark. Um, so lots of different things there. One thing that I did with the uh, uh, Roman Coliseum uh, project that I was talking about, is just, I made a nice sample lesson plan, which is why I talk about it here. So we'll cover that lesson actually uh, in, in a future lecture here. Um, but one of the things I did was I had a whole assignment where they had to uh, look up some information about the Coliseum and present it to people. Well. Uh, they got to pick which prompts that they assessed, or they could create them themselves. So uh, you're, allow you're giving them a hand in their own education, right? They get to pick for themselves, right? They're not just being dictated, right, uh, what they have to do, right? They can, you know, pick based on their interests. Maybe there's like 40 prompts. Uh, case study nine, and you think, well, it's hard to make 40 different prompts, uh, professor, right? We, we don't want to make 40 prompts. You know how much time that takes? Use chat GPT, right? Artificial intelligence, it will create prompts for you. And um, it won't create all of them. You're going to have to think of some yourself, and it might not uh, format them properly. Um, ex or, or, you know, um, it might not format them all in the same format, right? But, you know, you can edit that a little bit. A lot easier than creating 40 just off the top of your head. Um, anyways, you, students need to create a song about elements. Um, you could allow them to use, uh, you can allow them to make a music video. Um, you could allow them to have an instrumental in the background. Uh, you could allow them to bring in instruments themselves or provide instruments via the, uh, the school. Um, or you could, uh, um, geez, I don't know, allow them to work in groups. Um, there's a whole bunch of different things, case study nine. Uh, but the song itself is, is a form of differentiation. So whenever there's like something that's narrower, that's already, it's already differentiated. How can you make it even more differentiated, right? Um, allow them to present it in front of the class. Um, you know, lots of different things like that. Or... Uh, uh, maybe upload it to some website, for example, right? So that way they can they can hear it played back, right? So you get familiarized with um, uh, distributing of uh, the, dis the distribution of media. Um, so yeah, uh, case study ten, open ended, uh, the production, right, of the the song, right? So there's that. Um, so like, uh, are they working with? Um, I don't know what you really call it, because I'm not a person who works with this stuff, but uh, maybe they're using auto-tune, for example. I, I don't really know what it is. Maybe there's a scenario where uh, they don't do that. Maybe there's one where they do do it, but you know, think of different ways we can make it more unique, uh, more interesting, more appealing, uh, more practical, so they're learning more skills. Uh, and then lastly, case study 10, uh, students need to understand supply and demand. Uh, one really cool thing that I've done in the past was um, I've taken uh, fake money, right? So you print up a whole bunch of fake money, and um, uh, 
you, you hand it to the students, and you say, oh, well, each student starts off with $15, right? And, um, or $20 or something, right? And then, and then you give them two days in class to create a bunch of uh, pictures, right? Um, just like a bunch of artwork, right? And they have to buy and sell that to their friends, right? And so they get like 15 minutes to buy and sell it to their friends, and then they have to reflect on that, and then the next day they do it again, and uh, they got to reflect on supply and demand. And then you talk about supply and demand, things that they might have noticed, right, as a result of uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the simulation, right, or the little project, right? So maybe they notice, say, hey, look, well, if there was 45 copies of something, right, then we didn't want to buy it. We, the, the price was cheaper, right? Or maybe you could say, well, if there was a, the, the, the artwork wasn't that good, it was very basic, I could have done it in two minutes, then they're not going to want to buy it, right? So there's not, the less of a demand for it. Right, and so therefore the price went down. Um, so just little things like that. Uh, students that had extremely detailed art that was extremely good, um, maybe they didn't even want to sell it, right? So that's another issue, right? Um, but maybe the demand was there. So when they did sell it, uh, the price was pretty high. Um, and then also too, there's a limited a supply of money, right? So there's not, you're not getting any more, right? Once you run out, that's it, you run out. And, um, and then you're out of the game, right? You can only sell the, your pictures that you make, your new ones, right? And so that's something to take into consideration. Uh, very monopoly-esque in some regards, but uh, case study 10, right? Uh, you know, lots of different ways you can do that with supply and demand. A little, little, I don't know, scenario like that. Um, or you can have them do uh, a, uh, a game, right? So uh, when supply goes up and demand goes down, what happens to the price, right? Question mark for the price, right? Uh, when the supply goes up and the demand goes up, what happens to the price? When the price goes down, and um, the uh, demand, or no, when the price goes down and the supply goes down, um, what happens to the demand? Or what do you think happened to the demand? Right? So pretty interesting. Um, lots of ways to do that. Uh, but you can see there's lots of different examples here. We're constantly differentiating with all these different methods. Again, there's even way more than this. Um, but you know, again, trying to make it interesting, appealing to your students. And so um, so yeah, that's differentiation. So uh, conclusion. Uh, all right, conclusion. Differentiation means so much that it essentially means nothing, right? It essentially means nothing because it means so much. It means everything in some regards. Nothing, everything, right? There's not like one specific way. It's so broad, right? It covers everything. Like the word environment. What do you mean by environment? Environment means almost everything, right? Differentiation means almost everything. Um, so anything that you're doing to benefit your students um, is differentiation, right? And now you know. Right now, you know, right, and there's lots of different ways that you can do that. Lots of ideas um, for you to be a better teacher, be a better practitioner, to implement it to your classroom, um, especially as a student teacher too. When you're implementing these things, like, look, now you're gonna have a great time in interviews. You can say, look, I've done this, 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 and um, look, I've used this. Uh, I've used inquiry-based learning. I've used culturally relevant teaching. I've used project-based learning. Right. I've been engaging the stakeholders. Right. I've been making the proper seating charts. Right. I've been establishing great expectations from day one. And look, they're going to want to hire you. Um, the next step here, uh, help students understand content in accordance with their unique learning needs. Um, well, that was the, what we just talked about here. So that's the conclusion. Uh, again, understanding uh, differentiation is extremely important. It's one of those concepts you just have to understand. And um, well, now that you understand it, and uh, it's just a matter of just uh, putting your money where your mouth is, right? Actually doing it, which is a little bit more difficult, right? So you, I mean, you can think it, right? But then to actually implement that, create nice, detailed, uh, quality le uh, lessons for your students, um, that's something that you really want to be uh, um, striving for, and, uh, and you certainly can do. And so, um, well, with that said, uh, I guess thank you very much for uh, watching this lecture today. Um, this is the second lecture in the series. Uh, I'm Ian Phillips, the professor. If you want to follow me on social media, uh, follow me uh, at Ian Phillips USA. Um, links are in the description below. Put some timestamps as well if you want to go back. And um, well, that's that's pretty much it. Um, be, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe for some more content. And uh, thank.